What is the perfect movie franchise? Does such a thing truly exist? The license to watch podcast sets out to answer that age-old question. Join comedians Matt McGregor, Harris McCabe, and Colin Shaw as they dissect your favorite film franchises one movie at a time. Along for the ride is a different film industry guest for every episode. Listen as the boys play judge, jury, and executioner and decide which of your favorite movie franchises are worthy of a license to watch. Hello everyone, Screenplay Archaeology host Kiramid Head here. Before we get into today's episode, I just want to get some intro stuff out of the way. First things first, we are now part of the Fandom Lib Media Podcast Network, so I'm going to link their site down below. And that's why you would have just heard a promo for another podcast, because they're another one of the shows on the network. And as per usual, if you like the show and you'd like to know more, you can check out our social media pages on Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and even Instagram now. The show also has a Patreon if you're willing to gift money, but you don't really need to if you don't want to. And we also have a Discord server, which you can join if you want to chat with, you know, the group members there. So that link is going to be down below as well. So, yeah, sit back, guys, and enjoy the show. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Screenplay Archaeology Podcast. I'm your host, Kiermit Head, and we have finally left the Planet of the Apes. Yes, we have. And by we, I mean just him. Because you didn't do one of those episodes. I did not, in fact, do any of those, no. You were my backup for the one if I didn't hear from the one guy that I said. <laughs> Absolutely. But no, I, I, I will. Well, just to point it out, I will say that we are planning an, a plan to the apes thon on hot quality content sometime soon. I just don't know when. Yeah, as soon as we get something that's not best worst pictures. I know, dude. Paramount owns like every single thing that we're trying to upload, and it's really frustrating. So, yeah, we'll see you in like three years to upload more. Yeah, Paramount sucks. But yeah, why do they? Because they don't. They don't actually make anything anymore. They just copyright claim stuff. Boy, yep, that's, yeah, God forbid we actually make something cool or creative with a movie, you know, God forbid. Yeah, they just make, they literally make shitty Paramount Network shows and Mission Impossible movies and kind of Star Trek. But yeah, tonight we're going to be doing, you know, Jake's favorite <laughs> comic book company. We're going to be doing a DC character, although he didn't originate as a DC character. He, we're going to be doing... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. we're going to be doing Plastic Man, who was originally published by Quality Comics. Oh, hot quality comics. HQC. That's us. Uh, I was planning that joke, and that we, we timed it perfectly. You've been sitting on... That's why you've been pressuring me to do this. You've been sitting on that joke for weeks. No, this this episode <laughs> was your idea. That is true. That is true. <laughs> that is, I, I, did, I did completely lie. I, I'm very excited to do this episode. Yeah, but yeah, we're doing Plastic Man, written by the Wachowskis, yep. before anyone knew who they were. Before everything, before Matrix. Was this before Assassins? This is this would have been written after Assassins, but it's before it came out. Mm, damn, that's nuts. So they would, have, they would have written Assassins and Matrix and a couple other things before this. Wow, those people, huh? Yeah, and so this is, nine, this is a mid-90s draft of um that, that was written by them there's another script that's out there and i could have gotten but i figured you know with streamline it we'll do the script people actually care about not the right. one that was written by the writer of Ernest scared stupid for paul rubens to play plastic man <laughs> exactly and so yeah this is gonna be really fun just to give a quick synopsis of it in this version plastic man starts off as daniel eel o'brien who's this environmental activist who breaks into labs and, like, saves test subjects and animal test subjects and stuff like that. And yeah, he breaks into know. the wrong lab and gets turned into a test subject himself and gets turned into a plastic man. Yeah, which is, like, the best part to me. 
Also, like, if your name is Daniel, why do you go by Eel? Like, Dan is already, like, the normal nickname for you, but... That's because... Trying to be, like, cool. That's because that's his nickname in the comics. Is it? Yeah, he's Patrick Eel O'Brien. That's like, like, if I went by Ake. Like, that's not the ideal shortening well, of my name. It, it comes from... I think it comes from the fact because he's, like, an old, like an old timey 1940s gangster in the original comics. I think he's called the eel. And that's where that comes from. Really? I thought it was because he was slippery and slimy like an eel. No, he was already called eel. <laughs> wow. That more, you know, more, you know, and, and he really is like an old timey 1940s gangster in that stuff. I read a few issues. Well, I read, he was in an anthology comic called police comics. And I read like a few of those stories and, like, he literally, when he's not in the Plastic Man costume, he has a fedora and a pinstripe suit and everything. Oh, wow. That makes sense. But, yeah, that's... But, yeah, so I read a little bit of comics in preparation for this, and I'm glad I did, because the few issues of, like, the Gail Simone series, which is the most recent one I read, were goddamn hilarious. And I showed you, like, a couple panels of that. Uh, yeah, yes, you have. Um, where he transforms have... into different movie characters. <laughs> right, right, Absolutely. I have seen, or rather, I should say, I have read zero Plastic Man comics anything. I've only seen him in the animated shows like the Justice League and Static Shock, and that's about it. So I'm aware of who he is and what he does. Other than that, I have no exposure to his, like, backstory or anything. Like, I basically just did, like, a little bit of research, Mm -hmm. which was insane that I tried to do that because we initially were, like, on a really compressed schedule. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But so I so I read a few things, just him turning into Optimus Prime and saying these movies didn't make any sense at all. They're also slightly racist is just hilarious to me. It's funny because as they go on, they're not slightly. They just get no. more and more outward. They just get more and more misanthropic in general, where it's like, what's going on? Yeah, but that's, this is not the Bayformers podcast. That's true. We could do that for hours if we wanted to. I would rather not. What do you mean? Uh -oh. save it for when that next transformers movie comes out god almighty there is another one isn't there yeah they already finished filming it i don't know why or how <laughs> but yeah uh but so yeah plastic man he was a character who was like really super popular in his day in the 1940s and then called the comics shut down dc picked up the rights and they done stuff with him here and there ever since then but he's never been, like, a heavy hitter. Like, the most, like, well-known stuff he was in was, like, the Grant Morrison Justice League in the 90s. Yep. And I was reading about that, and there's this whole thing about how, like, Batman is the one who goes out of his way to recruit Plastic Man. Okay. Into the, into the JLA. Which I makes mean, that, that picture I showed you of him, they, they do a picture where he's, like, turned into, like, a fish. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. That is true. <laughs> and Batman looks super pissed off about which is really funny knowing that Batman is the one who who recruited him <laughs> that's really interesting too because like somebody with as smart as batman in the comics can probably like use plastic man who can literally become like anything like any actual thing there's some, a lot of cool shit you could probably do yeah he probably like, went like yeah this guy is supremely overpowered which the script only kind of touches on but yeah like yeah this guy could maybe fight superman if he wanted to <laughs> or at the very least he won't lose to superman yeah you know that's pretty interesting. Like he could, he, I mean, his powers are insane. Like I went into this thinking, like, oh, he's kind of like Mister Fantastic, and he stretches, but no, he can literally transform into anything he wants. Yeah, pretty much. Kind of wild. And it was just so much fun reading him like turning into like trucks and stuff, like chasing people down. Yeah, what the script calls people and how it refers to some people is like really funny sometimes. Yeah, we'll we'll get into that. And so, like, the idea of making a Plastic Man movie kind of, it started in, like, the late 80s. He had actually had, like, a cartoon show of his own in the early 80s. That's how popular he was. Did he? Yeah, I've not seen anything of it, but he did. I didn't know it existed. That's crazy. Yeah, and he's in, like, base, and, like, I think build, building off of the success of Tim Burton's Batman is why they first started sort of developing other DC movies around that time and didn't make any of them until like 2006 okay wow i just googled it uh the plastic band comedy adventure show <laughs> uh, wow. just, actually no they did do other non-super non-batman stuff they did fucking steel and catwoman before then my bad oh, of course yeah the, the cinematic classics bro they still want to charge you money to watch catwoman on youtube like really 
Yeah, I feel like that should... Well, first of all, if you can survive Catwoman, you deserve, like, a purple heart. That's something I've, else entirely. I never actually bothered to watch that, because I'm like, well, I want to watch Catwoman, but no Batman. That's not the reason you shouldn't watch it. There are plenty of reasons. Oh, I'm to aware. Watch it. Oh man, oh man. Uh, you, is... you love terrible scripts. That's your whole fucking show, Screen yeah. Archaeology. What do you mean? That's like your gold standard if you want to do something like that. Well, I've got the actual, the early Catwoman script, which is horrendous. Uh, I I don't know how it'd be worse. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I haven't actually. I, I'll actually have to watch that movie if I do that episode. That is true. You got to sit yourself through that by force. Okay. You got to strap I'll, yourself to the chair. I'll make you read that script too. It's from the writer of Batman Returns. That's a spinoff. Uh, God damn! Why do I know you? <laughs> <laughs> you reached out to me. I did. I did. I was like, mm, "Plastic baby, let's get there." Yeah, let's I was like, it. "Yeah, I was like one of the like it was me and that weird guy who kept mentioning um, who kept mentioning Whiplash on every video. We were like your only commenters for like years." Yeah, okay, so I don't know if you know about that, but it was, um, that's a friend. So, remember in, I think it was Good Burger. Oh, so where, that's, that's the guy. Yeah, okay, I know who it is. That's his friend who he's called out directly, and he's re- recommended Whiplash with that, and then his friend, as a joke, commented, and at the time, I believe every single video we'd uploaded. Yeah, it was every video. single video. <laughs> so, the, uh, no. hey, it did great for our metrics, I'll tell you that yeah, much. Yeah, but yeah, enough about Catwoman. Yep. Uh, Plastic Man inferred there was a script written in 1989 by Charles Gale. Because when I saw Gale as the name on, like, the file of an... Ooh, was it Bob Gale? No, it was Charles Gale who went on to write Ernest Scared Stupid. Yep. And it was meant to be a vehicle for Paul Rubens, a.k.a. Pee Wee Herman, building off of the hype of Pee Wee's Big Adventure and all that. Right. And the plot of that one is that he's, like, a, he's like a mechanic slash thief in... In like he's in like Honolulu, I think like right before World War Two, and like he ends up fighting like the Axis and stuff, like spies and stuff like that. Okay. And that got derailed by you can probably guess what it was. It was his fucking um, touching himself in public incident. Jesus, yeah. Which you would kind of expect that in the porno theater, but I, I digress. <laughs> yeah. Back when theaters full of porn was a thing, I guess. Yeah. Before the internet. Yeah. It's like, oh no, now I can touch myself to porn in the privacy of my own home. Which is the place to do that, ideally. <laughs> so <laughs> Pee Wee can watch it in his playhouse instead. <laughs> God. Oh God. But okay. But so that fell apart. And then in 92, it was, it was sometime in 1992, it was announced that Spielberg had picked it up to produce at his company Amblin. And they announced that the director was going to be Brian Spicer, who only ended up, who did a bunch of TV work and only ended up directing three movies in the 90s. And I'm going to go in reverse order because it's going to be funnier this way. He did For Richer or Poorer with Tim Allen. He did the, I think it was the McHale's Navy movie, but his debut in 1995 was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie. No! No way! <laughs> that was him? Yeah, he was going to do this. God, I haven't seen those other the first two you mentioned, but I, as a child, I I did see Mighty Morphin, and boy, oh boy, is it something? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I decided not to conclude that statement. I was perfectly <laughs> satisfied where it was. So, but yeah, that was just that that just blew my mind. And so he was attached in '92, and eventually the Wachowskis get hired to write this in '95. Now at this point. They don't have a single produced credit yet. They had written, the first thing they ever wrote was their horror spec Carnivore, which they couldn't sell because supposedly it was because of like the social commentary in it. But I don't, I kind of doubt that having read it. Right, right. Which that's a future episode I'm assuming you're going to want to do. Yeah, why not? You know, gotta complete your Wachowski collection. Hey, if it says Wachowski on it, you know I'll religiously follow it and then probably not like it. You did watch all three hours of Jupiter Ascending. All three? No, th- Cloud Atlas was three. Cloud Jupiter Atlas, was, Cloud. I meant Cloud was Atlas. Painful too. So, <laughs> yeah. And so they get hired, and for some reason, there's like a three year gap before this script is written. But no, they did Carnivore. They had already started working on The Matrix, and they had already they sold both The Matrix and Assassins in '94. And Assassins didn't come out until October of '95. And this script is dated 
It's a revised draft dated March 17th, 1995. So St. Patrick's Day. Okay. Yeah, that is true. Um, and I kind of told you because we're in real life we're recording it like a little bit before St. Patty's. So I've been encouraging you, Kieran Midhead, who edits this show, like, hey, you should do it on time for St. Patty's and see if you uh, can get like the anniversary of the script written date. So what I'm saying is if you're listening to this and he missed that date, it's entirely his fault and you should blame him and give him the hate mail. <laughs> Or Stop blame me. you, blame you for randomly getting the idea out of the No, 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 no. Definitely the first thing I said. <laughs> I will actually try. I yeah. will. I will put one of your thoughts on and just edit with that in the background. Oh, good. I'm so glad we can encourage more editing with our editing. It's cyclical. <laughs> but okay, so I'm gonna just you know jump. So yeah, they hadn't really done a whole lot yet. They were an unknown quantity. They hadn't even done bound. <laughs> They hadn't. That's true. It was either coming out or about to, right? Was uh, Bound 95? was 96. 96. Okay, so they were like gonna do Bound soon or whatever. And cool. so this okay. is this is on the cusp of, because there was a whole dust up with Assassins where it got substantially rewritten by Brian Helgeland because Richard Donner didn't like certain things about the script. Which is then they decided that they were only going to write stuff for themselves to direct. So this probably yeah. wasn't going to be their project. Okay, yep. All right, so it opens on scene, shown from the perspective of a mouse, and this is a bizarre sequence. I, I love, the, the opening literal lines are just fade in, interior cage, we are a lab mouse. Like, it's such a <laughs> funny way to start anything. Yes, and it's a test subject in a lab, and a woman picks it up, injects it with a blue liquid, but it then gets doused in white fluid inside the plexiglass tank, so... If you're not going to say it, I'm going to say it. Everything the body needs. Oh, no. Not dozer juice. And the mouse then turns gooey, plasticky, and slips through her fingers, literally, running away and slipping off into a graded drain. And we make a huge deal about this mouse escaping, and then we never go back to it. I was going to say, I thought the mouse would come back. I thought that would be, like, important, because it was the opening of the movie, you know? And because they need something from it. Yep. Like you think it. Yeah, well, we'll get into it as we go along because the technical, the technical specs of Plastic Man are gone into in a surprising amount of detail. Yep. Sometimes for comedic effect. Oftentimes for comedic effect. One hundred percent of the time, for comedic effect. Yep. And so we then go to a man whose face we don't quite see as he leaves a photo booth, practicing talking to someone named Susan. And Susan turns out to be Dr. Susan Bright, the woman from the lab, and we catch up with her as she leaves her brownstone for work. Yep. And she's soon approached by the man who turned out to be Daniel Eel O'Brien, who in the comics is named Patrick Eel O'Brien with an A instead of an E. And I have to wonder if they changed that because Patrick O'Brien with an A is the writer of the Master and Commander novels. Really? I didn't know that. Probably not. I'm probably just making that up in my head, but... Oh, strange. But I don't know if that was their reason or not. And he just... Her ex... He's her ex who has just gotten out of prison. It's a low-security work farm for white-collar criminals, according to her. Mm -hmm. You know, he just got out six months ago, and so they catch up with O'Brien talking about how he's followed her career while in jail, which involves work with nanomachines and polymerization, which yeah. is a real word, which Microsoft Word recognized... <laughs> polymerization i mean like a polymer is just plastic but the polymerization would mean that you're literally transforming something into plastic and that she's now working for argon laboratories and susan gets in her car and leaves like they literally just talk and it, it comes off really kind of phony but it's supposed to yep like it's not meant to be like a romantic thing yet right right which i actually like that they didn't push that immediately yeah, thank goodness. I think it's what made the script a little more interesting than it would have been. Yeah. And we then go to Argon Tower, where we get introduced to Icarus Argon, which, yes, that's really his name. Yep, at absolutely. First, at first, we see pictures and like a big statue of his former muscle-bound self before seeing him as he is now, withered and wheelchair-bound. And he talks to his wife, Poppy, who calls him Icky. Yeah. And his as paranoia, he's he's like really paranoia because he's convinced that Susan let the mouse escape on purpose. Like her project must be ready now. She's just stalling. She wants me to die. And Poppy's like, "Oh, you." Yeah, there's a, there's a lot strange about Icarus Argon. Well, like for one, I looked him up, and he's not like a comic character. I don't think. No, he's not. 
He just invented him. Yeah, they they invented most of this because because Plastic Man's origin is quite a bit different in the comics. He's like like I said, he's like a 1940s see that gangster who like yeah, robs see, yeah. a he robs a chemical he tries to rob a chemical plant and gets shot and like gets chemicals splashed on him and that turns him into Plastic Man. Yeah. I guess this script kind of ties it in a little bit better than, you know, shitty 30s comics or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. So, which, that's basically the origin of the Joker. Yeah, more or less. You know? <laughs> Before the Joker, because that origin wasn't written until well after the Joker was introduced. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, he was most supposed to be like a one-off. But yeah, no, Icarus Argon, A, you already hit it on the head. Like, the, the name is just, nobody's named this stupid name. <laughs> But um, also, like, calling him Icky B. I, I went off about nicknames earlier about Eel when your name is Dan. Icky? Like, of all the place, of all the ways to shorten Icarus Argon, like, I, that's just, the word <laughs> means disgusting. Like, wouldn't, I don't know. wouldn't you go by Ike? Ike? Yeah, what a normal name. But um, no, the rest of my criticisms with the villain cannot be told until we get into spoilers. So let's just keep going with the script. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, it, he is a very funny villain. Also, yes, why is. would you name your kid Icarus? Icarus is the dumbass who flew too close to the sun and died. Yeah, it foretells that your kid is going to suck. <laughs> like, come on, man. But whatever. But but Poppy's like, no, she's just trying to deal with the unstable waste created by the experiment. And it takes a while before they actually explain the waste. Like, they talk about it a lot, but it's like halfway through before they actually explain what they're doing, how it works. Yeah, and then they just turn, like, we won't get into it, but like this one thing into MacGuffin and that's like the whole point of the waste. And then you just, it's just a chase to get to this thing. And that's yeah. It, you know? And yeah. And so Susan soon arrives at the labs, but discovers that she has lost her ID card. And we then go to a cheap hotel room where we discovered that O'Brien lifted the ID off her and is replacing her picture with one of the photos taken in the booth. So he's passing himself off as someone named Susan. <laughs> Yes, that's okay. That's the fe- the best part that I thought of too. Is like he's obviously just like scanning it and going through because if they were like, "Hello, what's your name?" He can't be like, "I'm Susan." Like, <laughs> there's just no no way to do that. <laughs> also, like he's also relying on them not knowing who goes into the building every single day because she assumedly works daily because it's a normal human job. So, <laughs> but whatever. And so we go back to the lab where Susan's colleague, Dr. Nigel Nebelman, and having to spell this thing correctly every time in the notes, just, ugh, was, was a chore. I tells her written Nigel. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's because he's called, I always try and refer to characters as what the character headings call them. Yep. I always try and remain consistent with that. And, oh, that's fair. Yeah. Nebelman. Nebelman. Yeah, it tells her that the waste will remain active without the nanobot. And proposes catching the mouse somehow. And Susan is too distracted by O'Brien's reappearance, telling Nebelman that they dated when they were still students. As well as the fact that it's hard to tell what O'Brien wants. It's like, really? It's it's painfully clear. He says it every scene he's in. And so we go back to O'Brien as he walks down the street and confronts a businessman, Litterbug, who tosses a styrofoam cup into a hedge. And the litter bug just beats the crap out of him and leaves him on the sidewalk, which is pretty I want to point out that this script uses a lot of the term haw haw to describing how the litter bug talks to Plastic Man, who is not yes. like a normal man right now. <laughs> yes, he, he, he's just man. He's just man. So he talks to man and he's like, what are you going to do about it, huh? Haw haw. Like, I know it's <laughs> not supposed to be pronounced that way, but like, that's just how I read it. And so we go back to the lab and Susan reminds Nebelman about how Pernell Labs, who was working on the same stuff they are now, were broken into by an animal rights group who freed all the monkeys and caused a pile up on a nearby turnpike. So he's Brad Pitt from 12 Monkeys. Yep. <laughs> and according to Susan, the group was just one man, O'Brien, who we then see using his forged key card to get past the main gate. Yeah, I'll, this is kind of the start of something that like is very consistent throughout the movie. But like plastic, sorry, man, man is very much a jackass. Like, yes. he's just not a good person. Like, he talks all the time, like, oh, these environmental companies, they're so bad, I'm going to stop them. But, like, he's harming a lot of people in the process. It's, like, not Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's very strange. He doesn't ever, like, reform or anything, because that's the whole thing. Right. In the In the original comics is that he gets left for dead by his own gang. 
and yeah, he gets exactly. found and he gets found and nursed back to health by a monk and that inspires him to be a better person. Yeah, which in and of itself, you saying out loud is really funny. But um, like a yes, monk. It's like a random Franciscan person. monk. Yeah, I'm sure. Why wouldn't it be? But um, yeah, no, he, there's, I don't really see much of an arc with that. It's just more like a character flaw, you know, over and over again. We'll get yeah. there when we get there. And Sue, fuck was I? And so Susan, who, uh, having figured out what O'Brien must be up to, reports the missing ID badge to Argon's head of security, Sim, and his underling, Doby. Okay, yep, yep, that, those are the names. Lots of great names. Yeah, and they all figure out, they all figure that O'Brien was probably smart enough to use the card before they could invalidate it. Meaning he's likely to be in the building right now. And speaking of which, O'Brien wearing sunglasses and a fake mustache, to quote another DC movie. Is, is making his way through the halls when Susan catches a glimpse of him. But before she can really register that it's him, Nebelman arrives and tells her that Poppy is waiting in the lab. Yep. And Poppy informs Susan of how frustrated Argon is by the lack of progress and that he feels that a new experiment should proceed. And Susan says, hey, we rushed the first test, which resulted in the waste we now have to deal with. I'm like, well, maybe if you didn't drop the plastic mouse. Yeah. Oh, man. And, and, and so that's what we have to deal with. And she holds firm to prioritizing it despite Poppy's threats. And you know, so, you know Argon needs me to do this because I'm the only one who can do it. And she goes like, and Pop, Poppy makes some crack about her being able to do her job. And she goes like, yeah, but since he has no feeling below the waist, are you able to do your job? Yeah, that's <laughs> the best line in the whole goddamn script. That's so and, funny. And Poppy's like, how dare you? But, yeah. And, yeah, as she tells Nebelman, only she can make the nanobots necessary because apparently you can grow them in a in a jar or something. Oh, of course. Why wouldn't you be able to? <laughs> it's like the little people in the jars from Bride of Frankenstein. I knew you were going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> so she'll determine when the tests take place. And later that night, O'Brien, who has hidden himself inside a barrel in a storage room. So maybe he is plastic man already. <laughs> oh, Possibly. He climbs out of his hiding place and sneaks off into the facility. He enters the lab, and after freeing the lab mice, whom he refers to as POWs, <laughs> <laughs> he uses graphite powder to locate Susan's fingerprint on the number lock on the nanobot containment system. With the numbers and book full of important dates, numbers, etc., that relate to Susan, O'Brien opens the containment and grabs a vial of the nanobots. Like, okay, so he did his research. He knew her very well, apparently. I guess so. I mean, they did date, so... Yeah, they did date, but it's been years and he remembered all those dates to write them down? Yeah, he's... He's, he's not the... the he, he's a little strange. I'll just say it. He's kind of an asshole. <laughs> kind of an asshole. Kind of a dickhead. Yeah. But he gets caught by Sim and Doby, the latter bashing him over the head with his fist, knocking him out. Yep. I also continually forget to write Doby's name down, like, forget to write that he's in scenes in this, because he doesn't do anything. Yeah, that's true. So O'Brien comes to, strapped to a table with Sim, Argon, and Poppy standing over him. And Argon has, like, this whole thing where he's like, oh, yeah, you're cramming your environmental agenda down my throat. Now I'm going to cram this down your throat and injects him with the nanobot. <laughs> yeah. And we get to see the microscopic machine enter his bloodstream and bounce between protein cells. And this transitions to a flashback to the 70s. <laughs> where O'Brien and, and Susan are talking in a grocery store, and Susan's excited about her research, and O'Brien's like, yeah, but how do you know it won't get used as a weapon? Yeah. And then he gets, like, he starts, like, freaking out because he hates all the brand names on the shelves, and he starts messing with this kid who's trying to reach a box of tricks. He's going, like, no, eat this instead, you little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he's, just, he's just messing with this kid for no reason. Yeah, no, it's... It, it, I, dude... That is, like, maybe the most defining scene of, like, what we mean when we're, like, yeah, he's just a dickhead to people. That's a child, man. Like, he, he just wants tricks. Leave him alone. I'd, ima I'd imagine with the right actor, this could really work. <laughs> yes. Because it's, it's a funny scene as written. I think we mentioned it off um, recording, but, like, I the whole time, mid-90s, I imagined Jim Carrey in the role. Like, this is just the mask part two in a lot of parts. Like, he was rumored to be attached to it, but I don't know if anybody, I don't know if it was ever official. Mm -hmm. Like, he's the person that everybody was like, oh, it has to be him. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And he just made us a billion dollars with 
with Batman Forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it reminded me a lot of, say, The Mask combined with a little bit of Dumb and Dumber at times. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, that's why I imagine him carry because, like, he's very animated and, like, this role is just a live action cartoon in half the script. Yeah. So, yeah. And O'Brien wakes up inside a, teal, a steel test tank just as the white assembler fluid is pumped in. So, more dozer. More dozer, baby. Woo! And Argon leaves the tank on for so long that a coolant line bursts and the tank explodes, flooding the room with the white fluid. Oh, no. Oh, God. No. <laughs> Lord Almighty. Not the white fluid. <laughs> and O'Brien emerges from the fluid, his vision warped and his body shifting and flowing, having been completely polymerized. And yep. Ar- Argon, now knowing that the process works, orders Sim to grab O'Brien, only for the man to yank his arm out of his grip, making it as thin as spaghetti before stepping on the drain and inadvertently slipping through and out of his clothes. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. And Argon says they have to capture him, and we then go to O'Brien... Get rid of that fucking drain, by the way, if you keep losing things in it. (laughs) But Argon says they have to capture him, and we then go to O'Brien, squeezing through a six-inch pipe opening and into a storm drain, which he follows, emerging out of creek and walking away. And so Sim and Dobie arrive just too late to see him escape, and Sim's like, Dobie, you go in there and get him, because it's fucking dark in there. It's fucking dark in here. (laughs) Yeah, this, this guy was totally Joe Pants. God, I haven't said that in so long. Thank you for bringing that back. Yeah. Nope, don't mention it. But yeah, this character, if they were directing it, totally would be Joe Pants. Oh, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> I mean, Joe Pants is in like every Wachowski thing, so almost. Uh, I'm guessing he's not in Resurrections. <laughs> no, unfortunately, but he is in Sense8, so hell yeah. Oh, okay. And, and so... Because he doesn't want, he sends it because he doesn't want to get his shoes dirty in the sewage. And so, meanwhile, Poppy and Argon discuss the situation and how they need to catch O'Brien and run tests on him. And the waste from the exploded tank will also need to be cleaned up. And they go call Nebelman instead of Susan. Yep, yep. And so Nebelman is called in and promptly freaks out when he sees the mess that Argon has made with the assembler fluid. And he insists the only way to stabilize the meltdown is to get the nanobot that was used in the experiment. That it activates the fluid and makes it replicate and is less than happy when Argon tells him that it's gone. And since the replicators are less active at low temperatures, they decide that they're going to use liquid nitrogen to freeze it. And as he leaves with Nebelman, Sim and a very muddy Dobie enter the office and tell Poppy that they haven't found O'Brien, but they found his hotel room key in his clothing, so they know where he'll be going. Yep. Uh, yeah. And this is going to lead to the one of the... I guess the first truly weird scene that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the film going forward. Yeah, and it just cuts to him. He's in his hotel room taking a shower. So how did he get in there without the key? Um, wait. Good question. Yeah. Okay, wait. wait. And Hotels he... might give you two keys. Maybe on accident. Well, no, if he only brought one key and forgot it, that means that the other one's in the room. I don't know. Who knows? And it would have been in his pockets when he slipped out of his clothes. They should have put in a line where he's like, good thing I told the, the manager of the hotel to let me in or whatever. But yeah. Yeah, and he also was naked, so. And whilst being naked, I walked into the hotel and said, let me in. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, if you really think about it, it's like, wait, no, not at all. But he's taking a shower and he spits out a wad of plastic phlegm. And oh boy, do they go into all the different things that become plastic in this script. Yeah. The, there's a lot of plastic bodily fluids. <laughs> I, they like bubble up and oh, oh god, it's so weird. Okay, so in the lab, Nebelman discovers that the liquid has turned the floor into plastic as well, and trucks of liquid nitrogen are soon called in. And we go back to O'Brien, who is asleep in his hotel room and wakes up when his neck gets twisted and he can't breathe. <laughs> Which th- that's admittedly that's pretty funny. Yeah, that is. And soon, Sim and Dobie burst in, and they try to make him come with them at gunpoint. And O'Brien runs to the window and shouts for help. Sim tackles him to the ground and pistol whips him, only for his head to bounce off the floor. He keeps yes. trying to hit him, and, and keeps bouncing back. Lights out! Lights out! <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's so this good. Is, this is, the script gets fucking great when it does the plastic man stuff. It does. It, admittedly, you know what? This is a really creative way to do this, so props to him. Yeah, it just makes his head dribble like a basketball. 
Isn't that what they describe? That's the verbiage used? Yes, that's literally <laughs> what they use. Yeah, and, Sim, t- and Sim, who's tired of this, grabs his legs along with Dobie, and they try to physically drag him out of the room, only for O'Brien to hold onto the windowsill and get stretched out. <laughs> and they eventually let go, which snaps him like a rubber band and shoots him out the window where he falls to the street. Oh, and what? One hand is still hanging onto the sill, though, stretched out to a ridiculous length. So, and it, like, yeah, like, I'm reading this scene, right? This fucking ridiculous, like, tone-setting scene, if you will. And I'm just imagining, like, okay, I, I get it today. This is exactly what you do today if, like, a certain way is done. But, like, at the time, like, it would this have been, like, the mask where it's, like, all CG, like, manipulated footage? Or is it, like... Big practical fucking stretchy legs and arms and shit. It's like, that sounds awful. I don't so. know if it would even have been possible to do this. Yeah, maybe that's one of the reasons it like, died in the water. Yeah, supposedly time. it died because of budget reasons. Oh, yeah. I mean, you'd need, like, in the 90s, astronomical dollars to pull this off. I mean, we haven't even gotten, like, a great-looking Mr. Fantastic yet. I know. We got, like, really weird, corny him. But, like, at least in the mid-2000s, it's a lot easier than 10 years prior yeah. to effects like this with computers mostly yeah and that was a movie where like the first draft of it was written in 96 oh that makes so much sense if you think about it and, and it was script, better than it was better than the movie but oh yeah it, easily in the, the 90s movie you mean oh my god no 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 there was a no the draft for the 2005 movie was written in 96 oh you're saying that draft was better yeah Okay, yeah, and no, I am not familiar with that at all, so... Yeah, that's a whole thing I'll eventually have to do. Oh, don't you worry, I'll be here for you, baby. Oh, you <laughs> want to do a Marvel thing now? I don't know, why not? I've got, well, like, two we'll or three... Happens. I've had, like, two other people ask to do it, though, which is a weird thing, so I'll have no, to... that's fine. I'll, I'll pick my own unique poisons. <laughs> Wachowskis and Universal Monsters. Yep, yep, my oddly specific requirements. <laughs> But yeah, but yeah, his it stretched to a it stretched like a ridiculous length, and it falls to the ground where he lets it, he when he lets it go at first it coils up in like a big pile like like a hose and he's like he's like very much freaking out and it returns to normal arm shape and he runs for it when he sees the thugs watching from the window. Yep, and Sim calls up Poppy who hands the phone to Argon. After he admits that O'Brien got away, Argon threatens him, then says to track O'Brien down again. Only this time, just watch him, don't confront him. And a frustrated Sim hangs up the phone, but catches a break when he finds a picture of Susan in the room with a heart drawn on it. And we then see a news report the next morning. In four, so we get, we get some news position here. In four, we we us that Argon's weekend staff has been barred from the building, and that police and EPA officials have been flown in, and nobody knows why. And this guy's like has a character name, but I didn't fucking write it down. Can I also point out that there is realistic news reports position here? Because in movies, every single time they do news position, it's like two characters like, let's say, talking in real life. And then they hear a TV. They're like, what's that? Turn it up. And then it does the whole broadcast from the start. Whereas this script has it so they catch the news and it's a report that's just ending. And then she's like, oh, shit. And flips through the channels to find it. It's like, that's that's what would happen. That's more yeah, that Yeah, that does happen eventually. That's pretty cool. So that's like the first time maybe ever I've seen that in a movie. Done in a more realistic way, at least. So, whatever. Yeah, so Susan is watching this when O'Brien shows up at her front door explaining that something is wrong. And sliding his head through the gap between the door and the wall. <laughs> he points to the TV news report and says that Argon did this to him before very rapidly recapping the last several pages. He, yes. he does like he does the Michael Pena in Ant Man thing. Yep, yep. I, I like the idea that like as he keeps going, like his body, like an like an Italian stereotypically, like with the hands movement, but it's plasticky, so like the hands get bigger and stretch and all this kind of shit. So I kind of like that aspect. Yep, and she tells him about the mouse, etc., and says they've never been able to reverse the polymerization, to which O'Brien freaks out before Susan slaps his rubbery face. <laughs> and she then gives him coffee and diuretic pills to flush out the nanobot, which they need to deal with the waste. Yep, yeah, that is uh, an important story beat. <laughs> yep, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and after a quick cutaway to the Argon lab showing that the liquid nitrogen isn't able to keep up with the waste... We go to Susan's personal lab in the basement of her brownstone, where she tries to explain what happened to O'Brien. 
So basically, the nanobot combined his molecules with the plastic ones from the assembler fluid. However, only part of the assembler molecules are actually used in the combination, leaving the rest as unstable waste. And the leftovers called replicators polymerize things like the assemblers do, and but it doesn't last, causing things it touches to deteriorate within days. And if left unchecked, the replicators could have a devastating effect on Calumet City because this takes place in Calumet City, Illinois. Yes, it does. And that, that that's just really funny to me. We're not dealing with the fate of the world or New York or Gotham it's City or anything. The, the fate it's, of Illinois. It's the fate of one town in Illinois. Yeah, you know, like everybody watching this movie is like, okay, well, it's not that bad, you know, like of all the things. And plus, like, their protagonist is some dude who's, like, much of a dickhead as Man-Man. Well, now he's Plastic Man, actually. I can call him yeah. Plastic Man. Yeah, so. he's not regular guy. He's not man. <laughs> <laughs> so. Also, I do have to ask, it's just one nanobot that apparently went through his entire body and turned yeah. every molecule into plastic in the space of, like, ten minutes. Yeah, they refer to it in the singular, which is weird because, like... Humans have a lot of... There's like a trillion blood cells, like, alone. Like, how fast is this nanobot working? That's what I want to... Yeah, and there's another newscast cutaway where the reporter mentions the rumors that Argon was attacked by a radical environmentalist group and that a press conference will be held later that day. So, yeah, we don't really need that one. But we go back to the basement lab with Susan explaining that they have a 48-hour period in which to stabilize the waste after which the deteriorating materials will transform into a fragile solid. Or that's yeah. what happens when they do, because that does end up happening, but that's, we'll get to it. Yep, and then O'Brien goes, yet another miracle of modern science. <laughs> so He's such a dick. This, a massive asshole, although he does have <laughs> some really, for that reason, he has some pretty good zingers. I'll give him yeah. that. Yeah, Sim and Doey pull up in the car outside the brownstone and wait like Argon told them to. And Susan runs some diagnostic tests on O'Brien, which include like him like like breathing in and making his chest balloon out really far. And then he like opens his mouth and it opens up like the mummy. Yeah, breathe deep. <gasps> Not that deep. <laughs> like there's some good there's some good bits. I like that a lot. Yeah, and and Susan runs some diagnosis and say uh, it's explaining her theory. Her theory was that the process would correct any damaged or defective molecules, which is why Argon is so interested in her work because he thinks it will save him. Mm-hmm. So there's legit medical applications to Plastic Man. I uh, no, the script is pretending there is. There definitely yeah. is not medical <laughs> applications to being a Plastic Man. Yeah, well, in this universe, <laughs> in this world, in this DCEU. Oh God. The pre-CEU. Yeah. Imagine if they did a DCEU Plastic Man movie. You, you could verbatim take this script, swap a few names out, boom. Yeah, it, pretty much. It'd be just as connected as the rest of them are to each other. So. <laughs> Plastic Man ends up on the Suicide Squad. <laughs> yeah, oh, God. He would, though. James Gunn would write him. Yeah, J- James Gunn would do a good job of Plastic Man. Yeah, he would. I'm surprised he's not in uh, Peacemaker already. Oh, there's a lot of characters I'm surprised aren't in Peacemaker, like Snowflame. Yep. <laughs> the guy so, who gets his powers from cocaine. Yeah. Some uh, just get name dropped and then we'll never see them. Oh, well. Green Arrow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, so, but so Susan, after some issues, manages to draw some blood from O'Brien, which bounces around inside the hypodermic needle, which had me thinking way too much about certain other bodily fluids. Yep. Yep. So if his bodily fluids are also plastic, in this universe, does he need a condom? That's not the body part I thought about, but... (laughs) (laughs) Would it... Okay, I have two questions. A, because this is really the discussion to be had. A, would she even be able to get pregnant? And B, would it be toxic because it's actually plastic she's injecting? And would it be, would it bounce, or would it bounce around and just destroy her? Oh my god. God, I hope not. <laughs> now, I do know in the comic canon, he can impregnate a woman because he has an illegitimate son who has the same plastic powers as he does, only bigger. Oh god. That's nuts. Well, also, like, ingesting, like, you shouldn't eat, like, your water bottle, you know? Like, th- <laughs> I feel like if 
if, if he's like banging Susan, let's say hypothetically for the sake of argument, of course, if that, if that were to happen, I, I feel like she'd die in like a couple days. Like she'd get like poisoning. That's toxic. So he should wear the condom. No, because well, a condom is just more plastic. I I don't know. Would it change anything? Uh, well, it wouldn't. It, it wouldn't ingest into her. That is true. If he, these are the questions the scripts forces us to ask. <laughs> That's really the topic to be had. Oh. oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, well, based on, and we're not even in the thick of the bodily fluids yet. Oh, we we're about to get, we're right about there. Yeah, yeah. But O'Brien, who's feeling wired from the caffeine, suddenly has to go to the bathroom, and Susan hands him his beaker, and all we hear, we hear a sound effect of a kerplunk. <laughs> then he runs out, freak, freaked out, shows the sample to her, and it's, a yellow, viscous, rubber cement-like substance. He goes like, it's not biodegradable! <laughs> oh my god. It's, it, it just, the, dude, I will say this is a very, very funny script. I, I, not even unintentionally, like, it's intentionally funny and it hits. At, at times like this, like, I don't know, if I were in the theater and I was watching this, like, stupid shit, I'd, I'd probably start laughing. You know? Yeah, this yeah, this is it's a good comedy. In fact, this is like one of the very few things I can find anybody talking about. This is an interview with I forget which Wachowski it was, but they were very proud of this joke. <laughs> Jesus, a Wachowski interview? There's only like three of those ever. Yeah, and so this leads to them, you know, arguing back and forth about the stuff they normally do, and then that gives them a sense of nostalgia for the old days. And he thanks her for her help. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and so, I don't know. The, the O'Brien Susan relationship is, uh, I, I mean, they seem it's like very they're strange. friends, but like she's, they're clearly just friends because she's like allowing them to be friends. Like, yeah. She, she does not, she's not interested in that. But so back at Argon Labs, EPA representative John Joplin meets with Argon and Nebelman, who explain about the waste and what it's doing so we get another exposition scene about the waste. Woo, exposition waste! Before Feels like a fucking waste. Yeah, before bribing him with a suitcase full of money. Mm -hmm. And back at the brownstone, O'Brien is napping on the couch when he wakes up and gets hungry, stretching his head down to the basement to talk to Susan, who has realized that the urine sample doesn't contain the nanobot. And so you're going to have to drink more fluids. <laughs> yep. And they decide to test how far he can stretch, and they go into the backyard where he stretches his arm incredibly high, which Sim spots and then makes a phone call. And O'Brien stretches so far that his body thins out and his clothes fall off, after which Susan snips some of his hair before leaving to go get his blood properly tested. And yep. later, is, that's that's setting up a actually pretty clever thing, which I never would have thought of. Yeah, yeah, the way they, they to reveal it, it's the costume and how it gets made. Not the goggles, which are not in this. Yeah, but. well, I mean, you can only go so stupid, is the thing. <laughs> so. And... Later, as Argon and company arrive at the Cook County Courthouse for the press conference, O'Brien is watching Itchy and Scratchy on TV, mm -hmm. having drunk a whole trash bag full of soda bottles. So again, the Itchy and Scratchy reference is pretty funny. So this takes place in the Simpsons universe. It does it? Or is it? Yeah, because Itchy and Scratchy is Simpsons, which means... So, what? okay. Yes? But also, like, no. He's watching Itchy and Scratchy. He the is. show, the which is just show. which is just a show within the Simpsons. So this is the Simpsons universe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're right. This takes place in the Simpsons lore, <laughs> whether you like it or not. As I mean, anything could technically take place in the Simpsons lore. That's how, pardon the pun, plastic it is. Yeah, that is true. It's not that much of a stretch. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he's, that, I did not think of that until just now. Well, yeah, he goofs around with fitting his head into a vase for a bit before yeah. running off to the bathroom to pee again. And this time we see, thanks to a microscopic zoom in, that the nanobot is indeed in this beaker of plastic pee. Ooh, baby, let's go. And so at the press conference, both Joplin and Poppy give statements downplaying the severity of the waste spill and blaming it all on an attack by eco-terrorists, even mentioning O'Brien by name. And this really doesn't amount to anything like... Oh, you're a wanted man, huh? Goes nowhere. Yep. And Susan soon returns home, finding that O'Brien has managed to turn himself into a flesh-colored love seat. So that's <laughs> them playing with the crazy shit he can do in the comics. Pretty much. Which is weird, like, they use the term flesh-colored. 
like, I, it's just, to me, it's like, I, I always overthink, like, what part of his body is each aspect of this couch? Oh, no, don't go there. There's, like, an ass cheek that you're just going to be putting your, like, back against or something. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, there's God. that going on. Yeah, I yeah, sit don't. On a guy. <laughs> don't don't go there. We already we already went to the semen place. We did, we did. I I just I would never sit on plastic man. I I, I don't trust it. <laughs> I, I just don't. I don't know you what don't plastic tr- I'm you, sitting you, on. You, yeah, you don't trust him not to grope you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or did he, as a joke, just inflate his dick to be the size of a couch? And I'm just <laughs> surrounded. Like I don't know. He, he, he would could. do that. He, he would, would do that. Could. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not about that life. Oh. Uh, but no, she presents him with a stretchy red outfit and boots synthesized by a friend of hers using the hair samples. And O'Brien yes. puts the suit on and comes out of the bathroom to find that Susan is watching the news. And they learn that he has a wanted man again. Mm-hmm. But before anything can happen, Sim and Doby break down the door and hold him at gunpoint. O'Brien isn't sure if he's bulletproof or not, so that still works. And Susan passes off the urine sample as lemonade and leaves it behind. Oh, yep. Absolutely. That in the abominable snowman sense of lemon. <laughs> um, Before that. Y- yeah, yeah, the lemonade part. So, wait, did you skip over the fact that he recites the Green Lantern Oath? Oh, he does! You totally missed that. <laughs> I did. I did. Is he doing it while he's in the bathroom? He, he bounds out of the bathroom. That is the verbiage used. Yes. He says, In brightest day nor darkest night, no evil shall escape my sight. And it's just flat out ignored, and the scene just goes on. Yeah. <laughs> That would be Ian's favorite part of the movie. What? A, I feel like he'd be pissed. He's like, there's no Lantern movie, but you fucking took his oath and put it here. <laughs> I can see it now. That's exactly what he'd be saying. I mean, hey, Hector Hammond got to be in, in the Batman. Oh, did he? He was the DA. Oh, my God. He's the DA. I got to tell you, I didn't even realize that. I'm telling yeah. you right now in this moment while <laughs> we're doing this show. You text, text messaging him going, hey. Oh, my God. Hector Hammond. I'm not even saying it's the actor. Is the DA in the Batman? All right, I sent it. All right, so Argon, they get herded into a limo outside. Argon, Poppy, and Nebelman are inside the back of the limo. Argon introduces himself, threatening O'Brien with handing him over to the authorities and talking about how he he made his first fortune on PVC, which is all Poppy wears, by the way. So she's like a bondage freak. I think it's just really funny that PVC also means like plastic, like tube and piping. Yeah, <laughs> everything even, in this yeah. script is plastic. Oh, Ian. Okay, I we have a response from Ian. He has sent me. <laughs> he has sent me. You know the emoji where it's the eyeballs looking very curiously. Yeah. it's that twice in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Two pairs of eyeballs looking. But um, yeah. So Please that's the second. That's the second Green Lantern actor to get another DC movie. Oh God Almighty! But so yeah, yeah. PVC. He lectures them about his new point of view. That the body is just part of nature and nature is the enemy, blah, blah, blah. Science is our weapon against it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It is an interesting villain to be like literally the epitome of like what somebody would imagine an environmentalist evil guy is doing. You know what I mean? Like it's literally like, oh, well, the the people that own all the big companies, you know, they probably think this way. This is literally the way that like people think that they would think. It's like, ah, mankind is creating their own clouds by blackening the skies. We're taking over the earth. We're fucking ruling everything. Fuck you, nature. You know, he's like that literal stereotype, which is just really funny. And he wasn't this until like this moment. Right, right. Yeah. Up to this point, he just wanted to get plasticized because he wanted to be leg guy or something. I don't know. He he wanted to he wanted to fix his condition, whatever it is. His uh, anti leg condition. His 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 anti leg equation. <laughs> <laughs> and now he wanted to be the plastic man. That's been stuck in my head since I've been reading the whole script. Uh, you know, I've been sending that video of the actual music video of Classic Man to you over and over again. So, no, you haven't been. No, oh, just the once then. You might have done it the once, yeah. I did it the once. I know I did. Now I probably promptly forgot about it. I've been promptly sending it to everybody else I know then, so. <laughs> <laughs> and he says we'll just have Nebelman cut out the nanobot, and when O'Brien just goes, ha, huh, it's not in me anymore, like a moron. Yeah. Oh, God. And Argon orders Nebelman to take care of them with a sedative needle and radios up Sim, telling him to head back to the house. O'Brien grabs through the needle, melding his hand with Nebelman's, which is just, ugh. 
Yep. Strange. And, and Poppy pulls a gun. Susan shoves her out of the way. O'Brien squirts the sedative in the Nebelman's face, and it's Susan's insistence makes a run for it, slipping out of his clothes and sliding into the trunk and out of the car. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's like a variant cover of that 2018 Plastic Man series where he does like someone's got a gun on him. And he sticks his fingers through the barrel out the back and three stooges pokes them in the eyes. I kind of wish that happened in this scene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the whole point of Plastic Man is just creating cool, interesting panels to look at with his body worming around doing all kinds of cool stuff. So. And just being really funny and ridiculous. Yeah, so I'm glad the script kind of leans into that. Like, that's the best part of the characters. So. Okay, so we get Plastic Man on the freeway. When I read this was happening, I got so excited. I'm like, is this just going to be, like, the highway chase from Matrix Reloaded with the Plastic Man? But sadly, <laughs> that's, no. I also got those vibes. I also got strong vibes about that. And not just because it's a Wachowski script, which is even funnier, but I, I also got, like, that that energy. Yeah, sadly, it doesn't quite go that far. <laughs> Not cool. But he's like standing on the trunk and he flings himself like a rubber band and bounces from car to car on the highway. And like he, he eventually did. bounces into a backyard and from there he leaps into the air, bounding his way back to the brownstone. And Nebelman calls Sim from the limo, walks him through what the sample should look like, and Sim spots the lemonade right away and takes it. Mm-hmm. O'Brien arrives outside just as they're leaving, hanging back as they get in the car and clinging to the undercarriage as they drive away. I'm just thinking of Sideshow Bob in that Simpsons episode, <laughs> which is an actual scene from a real movie, which is just strange to me. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. God. And the limo arrives back at Argon Labs and Argon orders Nebelman to bring him the nanobot as soon as Sim brings it, as he mm. wants to repeat the process of what happened to O'Brien on himself. Despite Susan's protestation, they should use it on the assembler waste. And Argon shows Susan into his garden where the plants are all genetically engineered monstrosities, so he's poison ivy now. Yeah, pretty much. Which he views as his children, but you hate nature. Yeah, he only likes artificial nature. He only likes <laughs> being a plastic. <laughs> and we see Sim's car arrive in the parking garage, and O'Brien crawls out from underneath, and he's all beat the fuck like he actually would be. Yep, yep. And it would be perfect if he just stepped on a rake in this scene. Oh, it just whacks him in the head. Actually, let me look up and see when did that episode air? Because I want to know if it was before this. So you could plausibly say that they watched that and went, let's put that in. October 7th, 1993. Ooh, yeah, yeah, okay, prime time. They probably watched Cape Fear as well and went, oh yeah, let's do that. We'll do a little bit of everything. Yeah, remix it in. It'd be good. And so back to the notes and we go back to the garden where Argon explains his philosophy to Susan. Science is the path to divine perfection. And he yep. cites the unchanging plastic bottle as an example. It is unchanging, but it's not a good thing. And he gets word that the nanobot has arrived and quickly shuts down Susan's objections. Yep. I'm like, if you like plastic so much, you should just become king of that plastic island in the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. That, that big thing that just won't stop growing. And so O'Brien makes his way through the building, transforming into a painting on the wall to hide from some guards. So, yeah, we're doing more of that classic Plastic Man stuff. Yep, yep. And Susan is now being kept under guard in her room where Nebelman tries to convince her to go along with Argon's plan. And there's a quick cutaway to O'Brien covering a guard's face with one of his hands like it's a plastic bag until he blacks out, which is <laughs> that's a cool use of the powers. Very cool use. I just, it, it walks the line between murder and just knocking somebody out. Depends how you, you, you know, interpret it. It's the other Christian Bale Batman who doesn't kill people except when he does. Yeah, like frequently. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell Catwoman no guns, no killing, and then I'm just going to shoot mm -hmm. missiles at Talia. <laughs> how dare Batfleck kill 800 people? Christian Bale is a saint. <laughs> except not at all. Even the Burtman Batman killed. Even Adam West's he, Batman killed. Even Kilmer killed. Yeah. Clooney. And he spends Probably yeah he spends kills. he spends that entire movie going no Robin don't kill Two Face only for him to just fucking kill Two Face at the end of the movie literally oh so much murder is going on <laughs> oh god Pattinson is the only one who sticks to the no kill rule um I I guess. no like Clooney Clooney doesn't kill anybody Clooney doesn't kill anybody because well I mean like there's just this big stunt show at that point but like I don't know Pattinson he's wrecking a lot of cars in his chase that also, is true like, but you can the, put that on the penguin 
there, there's no guarantee that the the the, the absolute beatdown at the start of the movie didn't at least claim one or two lives. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that play plays out. We did not see a body. We did not. We did not. Which doesn't stop people bitching about Man of Steel, but... Well, Man of Steel is a different can of worms. Yeah, that, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, I don't like want to get leveled it. by a, like a <laughs> nuclear attack. <laughs> yeah, I don't want. I want to get into that. Yeah, exactly. I'll have to bring it up later as like a comparison point, but not that thing for Man of Steel. Hey, hey you do you, man. I'm here for you. <laughs> but um, but but yeah, we go back to Susan who flat out refuses Nebelman's offer as well as the idea of handing over the nanobot designs to Argon, and makes him leave. O'Brien starts searching different rooms for Susan when Argon and Poppy emerge from the nearby elevator, forcing him to hide in one of their rooms. Yep. <laughs> and it turns out it's Poppy's room, and O'Brien disguises himself as an Ottoman, the furniture, not the Turkish Empire. I assumed it wasn't the Turkish <laughs> Empire in her room. <laughs> from from um, from one of the best worst pictures. Yes, yes, the entire Ottoman Empire. But yeah. That's coming up in just a few episodes, too. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, we're we're getting there, baby. We're also recording. I, th- I think we have like two or three ahead recorded. So you know, strap in, baby. Yeah, yeah. And, that pop- and so Poppy actually stands on him as she implores the Argon to polymerize her as well, because plastic is forever like love. Oh, she's almost classic Harley Quinn in this. Yeah, she's very, very one note. You know, classic like. I'm just here to to serve the the guy all the time and make sure that I do what he wants. Like, it's, you know, it's that. It's Miss Tessmacher. And Argon says he'll consider it after which, and leaves after which O'Brien just slinks off the Poppy's bathroom because apparently standing on him actually hurts him. And she she soon heads through the bathroom herself and he flushes himself down the toilet to get away. Yep. He literally, like, could have become the ceiling or, like, the floor or something. And he's like, you know what? The only way that I, with this like well, literally like magical body, can escape this is by going down the drain. Well, he, he can't change his color, is the thing. Yeah, but like he could also like stuff himself into like the corner of the room, and then if she sees yeah. him, just like you know, do the big hand thing again. <laughs> yeah, but the toilet the toilet is really funny. Oh, good point. I didn't think about how funny the toilet would be. <laughs> <laughs> but so there's a cutaway that establishes Sim is watching Susan through a hidden camera. O'Brien wiggles through the water pipes, eventually emerging from Susan's toilet against all odds. Like, there's even a line that, like, hangs a lampshade on that. Yup, yup. And they determine to head for Argon's private lab to retrieve the nanobot, because he has more than one lab. But as soon as O'Brien opens the door, he is forced back into the room at gunpoint by Sim, who is soon followed by Dobie, Argon, Poppy, and a load of armed guards. Yep. And after some, some banter, O'Brien snatches Sim's gun with his tongue ugh, and points it at Argon. <laughs> but Dobie grabs Susan and aims his gun at her head. And O'Brien is forced to give up and the gardener arrives, who is never really specified, never gets a name, never shows their face. It's always wearing like this breathing apparatus and sprays him with a chemical that makes him pass out. And Argon says his fate rests entirely in Susan's hands. Yep. Yeah, I didn't really pick up on the gardener character much i just i saw him pop up i saw the comment about like give or take that mask off does it get hot or whatever and that's about it well there's nothing to pick up on they're just there yeah like he just, yeah it could have used a little bit more work in that part and so o'brien's taken to the garden where the gas mix that was used on him is pumped in through the humidifier keeping him groggy and incapable of doing yep. and Sus- susan makes the deal to give argon the design in exchange for letting them both go and he seems to agree, heading off for the lab while Susan is sent back to her room. Yep. <laughs> and O'Brien unsuccessfully tries to tamper with the gas canisters. Susan gets an idea, switching her lights off and barricading the door while opening the freezer unit, which is apparently in her room. Yep. Argon gets ready for the process. Poppy pesters him without doing it to her as well again, before he's led off by Nebelman and another doctor named Mikao. Yep. Sim and Dobie try to break into Susan's room while she applies the assembler waste to the window bars and the stool, slipping out the, of the window and attempting to lower herself to the main lab's roof below. Yeah. And the reporter's outside, thinking she's a jumper, watch as the stool's leg doesn't stretch far enough in bungees, making her fall to the roof, but she's okay because it's been so polymerized by the waist that she bounces off it like a trampoline. <laughs> Which is really funny, because... 
then we're going to get into like the the plastic house pretty soon. Yeah, that's fun. And so Sim and Dobie find Susan gone from her room. And as she makes her way through the polymerized main lab, I typed that word out way more times than I ever thought I would. We see <laughs> Argon receive the nanobot injection and drag his body into the new assembler chamber. And as the dozer floods the chamber, <laughs> Argon just starts screaming. Yep, yep. And O'Brien, once again, tries and fails to bust out the garden, this time by turning one of his arms into a tire jack and putting pressure on the glass. Yeah, it's well, fantastic. Yeah, they put more effort into stuff for him to do with his plastic than the Green Lantern did with the Green Lantern ring. In the yeah, movie. dude, Green Lantern had like three or four big things. And like one of them was like a Hot Wheels track when in like Plastic Man. I mean, they're really going all out, which is what you should be doing here. So hell yeah. And so Susan sneaks through the main lab and the polymerization process completes and Argon bursts from a saran wrap like shell restored to his former <laughs> strong self and lets out a primal scream that is heard all over the building, including by the reporters outside. Yeah. And the scream causes two of the cleanup workers to spot Susan, who uses the rubbery nature of the building as well as the liquid nitrogen to take them down and steal one of their containment suits. Like she literally bounces off the walls and like flies it. Yep. So it's a bounce house now. It is. Yeah, the whole house is a plastic man. So I'm really excited for the plastic man house. A plastic man, house man, house man, plastic. man, house of the plastic man. Could there be a connection? That's a that's a universal monster movie we need. Yeah, exactly. Dude, he'd fit perfectly in. Abbott and Costello. Yeah, yeah. This is just an Abbott Costello meet <laughs> the plastic man house. <laughs> and so Argon is totally enraptured by his newly restored and polymerized body, as is Poppy, and yep. he goes on yet another rant about how this is more than mere science; it's a miracle. Yep. And threatens Sim with his new abilities when he learns that Susan has escaped. And Susan, in her new outfit, sneaks past the bulk of the cleanup crew, you know, doing that classic thing that they do in, like, the original Mortal Kombat movie, etc. Yep, yep, pretty much. Every James Bond movie. <laughs> exactly. Telling their captain that the building is done for and that it's even spreading to the underground pipes and the phone lines. Yeah, the, the phone line, the pl the polymerized phone line. I really want to uh, call somebody on that. <laughs> and meanwhile, like. O'Brien has tried to make his finger into a glass cutter and cut his way out, but the gas continues to overpower him. Yep. And Argon, now dressing himself in a suit like O'Brien's, only black, which, not sure how they knew to make that, but they're in Poppy, he's in Poppy's room and is informed by Sim that the captain of the cleanup crew wants the building evacuated. Yep. And... Nebelman concurs, and Argon says the gardener will take care of O'Brien, and agrees to let Nebelman have the body to study. Oh, and oh man, I don't even want to know what they're going to get up to with that. I don't even want to know what would happen to him when he dies. Can he die? I mean, more importantly, too, like a Argon's already a plastic man, so who cares about O'Brien now? And then B, you have an entire plastic man house, man house. Yeah. So, so like. Aside from the nanobot, which they already know isn't in him, like, it's just not important. <laughs> you can just move yeah. on. Yeah. And so Sim, Dobie, and Nebelman head to the conservatory, and the gardener turns off the gas pumps, effectively trying to make O'Brien suffocate to death. Yep. And the crewman then enters, saying they've located Susan and lunges at Sim, only for Dobie to smell something fishy and grab them, ripping the helmet off and revealing Susan. I don't want to know what he smelled. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> and seeing that O'Brien is near death, Susan fights back, biting Dobie and grabbing Sim's gun, shooting a hole in the plexiglass wall, allowing enough room for him to escape. And yep. Nebelman hides behind Dobie. The gardener runs off to get his spray can. And Nebelman holds Susan at gunpoint. O'Brien goads Sim into shooting him instead, and his rubber body actually stops the bullet, flinging it back at Sim and killing him. So, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, bye Joe. Uh, bye Joe Pants. Yeah, pretty much, dude. This forget this 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 fun lighthearted comedy movie is uh has a pretty high body count. So yeah, God Almighty. I mean, first of all, awesome the fact that Plastic Man actually is bulletproof. The fact that he just like bounce it back. But um, yeah, that is cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I and, and also about the body count. This is the Wachowskis who 
did the Matrix, which ends with Neo just flat out murdering all these people. <laughs> true, true. The, the Matrix's body count is surprisingly high. Or zero, depending on what how you look at it. <laughs> well, no, it would have to be very high because what happens to you in the Matrix happens to you in real life. Yeah, that is true. Although you could argue, like, are they really, like, normal people? Because they're all grown now. They're akin to zombies, one could say. Okay. Yeah, and they could be possessed by Smith at any moment. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. It's a pretty interesting question. But Smith or Kristoff from Frozen in the new movie. Oh, speaking of Smith, I don't know if you've gotten to the line yet, but he, he says things like, apropos, and I'm a new man, so to speak. Apparently free. Like, they use a lot of Smith lines. Oh, yeah, um, for Argon. Yeah, for Argon. They they use, like, especially in parts two and three of Matrix, they, they took a lot of um a lot of that shit and put it into the Argon. So you were picturing Hugo Weaving as Argon. Not until he started talking about that, but yeah, <laughs> retroactively I am. I mean, look, Hugo yes. Weaving is a perfect villain for all films. The muscle-bound Hugo Weaving. The very stretchy, shiny Hugo Weaving, yes. <laughs> yeah, he could uh, transform into an Asian man. Oh, yeah, he's already done that on screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so and so Susan, do, she dove out of the way just in time, and then he turns his fists into sledgehammers and beats Dobie unconscious while Susan collars Nebelman, who faints from fear when she threatens to punch him. Yep. And then uh, the gardener tries to spray O'Brien again, but he just makes a bellows, sucks the gas up, and then sprays it right back at him through his gas mask, and he crashes into a sea monkey enclosure and gets swarmed. Yeah. So, Dad? Look, there's no way that's not. There's no way that's not. <laughs> absolutely not. Or is, I it's, say. It's it like, is. It's like all those It's like all those guys in Axis Chemicals at, um, in the yeah. Tim Burton Batman where he just blows the whole building up. Oh, yeah. It's just like hell breaks absolutely crazily loose. And, and Susan falls into O'Brien's arms and after describing her attraction in biological scientific terms, which was really funny yeah like my adrenal glands are pumping yeah that's pretty fa fantastic i appreciate that stuff it reminds yeah, me there's they... a scene like that in have you seen bedazzled with brendan fraser yes i have there's a scene where he wishes that he's like the most smartest sophisticated man ever and he's doing the same thing to a girl when they're about to kiss he's like oh <laughs> yes your pleasure olfactory <laughs> blah 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 senses blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's pretty great so brendan fraser as plastic man yeah of course easily yeah, but the dazzles are great. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I don't speak Spanish, <laughs> but no, they kiss, and it at first seems to make the building itself shake. That it's that powerful, but no, it's just the meltdown finally reaching the tower. Yep, yep. And Susan tells O'Brien that the nanobot is gone, and Argon is polymerized. O'Brien is just like, you know, what if I just physically take Argon and yeet him into the into the reactor? Pretty much. That is, yeah. <laughs> and she goes, man, that might, that might work. That is certainly an option here. Although there will still be some waste left over because they have not found the mouse. No, not at all. Sequel hook? I don't think so. Mm, no, I think they just, I think like they a... just, they just forgot about it. I was, yeah, I was about to say, there's just a <laughs> dropped plot line here. And so Argon, Argon, who is banging Poppy, notices that the building is, is shaking he goes like, hmm, what's time to vacate the premises? Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, the script forces us to ask questions like, what would a plastic man do in bed? Probably they could plastic. do anything. Probably just inflate the penis and not much else. Well, they can technically turn into anything they want. Oh, shit. So they could totally role play that shit. Like, Yeah, yeah, he could. Uh, oh, God. Possibilities, man. Possibilities. Like, hey, you want me to be Tom Holland? <laughs> he form fits his face to look like a Tom Holland and then form fits his body to be ripped like Tom Holland yeah I can give you Tom Holland or I can give you Mark Wahlberg I can give you the whole Uncharted cast it's just head to toe I'll feel like a condom so that may or may not add to it for you <laughs> he's like yeah let, let's let's get out of the here you know like which you should have done already oh yeah and so O'Brien and Susan they argue on the way to the roof and Susan's saying you should just forget about Argon and get out of there well, he's planning to lower her to the ground from the roof instead of just sending her down and out the door. Yep. <laughs> and they're interrupted by Argon and Poppy emerging from an elevator on their way to the helicopter on the roof. That's where and... Argon goes, how apropos. Just like the architect did in part two. 
<laughs> Ergo, he's at the... And, that's, and after that is the line where he's like, as you can see, I am a new man, just like you. <laughs> Oh, that's great. A new Wolfman 2010 sequel. 2010's The Wolfman, a.k.a. Asian Hugo Weaving. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. And so the plastic men begin to fight, crashing through the window and brawling in midair as they fall to the ground. It's like a stage shift in Mortal Kombat. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Or um, Injustice. Guys, you... Plastic Man in Injustice? Uh, I would assume so. He would. Be oh, yeah, that's right. You, you, you... Yeah, that would be fun. Um, but also, like, I love how even, like, in the 90s, it's still doing, like, the MCU thing, you know, 20 years prior to the MCU, where the bad guy's gonna do the, the hero thing, and then they're gonna fight with the same powers again. Yeah. yeah. But, you know what, that, it's Plastic that's been... Man, so, like, you get to see a bunch of body parts becoming objects in a yeah. row. So that's really cool. I, I see why it's happening here. You, you cool. could do pretty creative stuff with it. Yep. And that trope's been happening since at least Superman 2. Oh sure, absolutely. But like, and and kind of in every creative. yeah, and kind of in every Batman movie because most of his villains don't have powers. Well, yeah, it's just dudes punching. But, yeah. um, <laughs> mostly Batman punching. But uh, yeah, no, I guess here it makes sense because you can get creative with the, the what you're doing with the plastic man powers, whereas like Black Panther, it's just two dudes in cat costumes. You know, not a whole lot going on. Two dudes in CGI. In very much CGI. Or Ant Man. I feel like MCU's like preloaded the next five fight scenes for their next movies all before oh, that's the script what they, like written. That's that's what they do. They very heavily previs everything. Oh yeah. Uh specific, like the action, they even like not to get too off topic here, but like there are directors that have turned them down because like they say like the the Marvel will say things like, Yeah, you know, write the script, do the movie, but like leave all the action to us. Don't direct it. And it's like, what what? That's uh, that's like the best part. Don't don't well, let me do that but whatever. Which is part of Ice Shang-Chi was so pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. But yeah, all right, here we go. And then, then the terrible green screen showed up at the end. It's like, ooh. Ah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that bad, but it was less than the rest of the movie. Which Every time the, every time they showed the cliff face, it's like, oh God, that's not there. <laughs> <laughs> or the, like, just the environment being like that weird shitty gray that's in all the MCU third acts. I'm not a fan. <laughs> Isn't that the Snyder color? Snyder's very high contrast. The MCU is like washed out gray. Well, I was thinking more. Man of Steel is very gray. Yeah, it is. Because he's trying right. to be Nolan in that movie. Yeah, and he's trying to be the lighthouse with Justice League, 4x3, <laughs> black and white. Volko versus Batman. Yeah, pretty much. I forgot that movie was in 4 I forgot Snyder's Justice League was in 4 3. God damn it. And he made Justice as gray, just like he intended somehow. But yeah, they. Brawl in midair, they fall to the ground in full view of the reporters who remove the polymerized fence to get a better look at the fight. Oh, yeah, and of course. Argon is a quick learner, but O'Brien has more experience with these powers than he does, and they continue the fight. As I did write his name down, Spencer, the main reporter, gives coverage. And so O'Brien proceeds to beat Argon unconscious. And I like this because the villain isn't automatically like a master of the powers that the hero got significantly before he did. Yep. Man of Steel? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Man of Steel is like, ha ha ha, I'm trained, even though I just got these fucking, even though I just breathed in the air here like an hour ago. I Where know. did you train? On a farm? Yeah. How have you lived this life on Krypton? But, but no, there's even that scene, not to fire off on Man of Steel again, but like, there's even that scene where like, Jor-El is like, why are you terraforming the planet? Why do you not want to be like, you know, Superman here and live with the humans? And then Zod is like, well, you want to force us to adapt in this horrible painful way and then it's like you adapted in like 30 minutes and you're fine <laughs> and it's like, like his, his his combat skills weren't even that supposedly they're all bred to their casts on krypton yeah but he got beat by a scientist like hands down <laughs> absolutely he so. only won because he cheated and pulled out his fucking like assassin's creed blade. <laughs> yeah which did shoot out of his wrist so yeah no, it didn't really make much sense. But yeah, but yeah, it is. It is cool that like like Argon kind of sucks at this. <laughs> and Very much. And Susan and Poppy they have their own designated uh, cat fight in Argon's office with Poppy pulling a knife before Susan tries to drop a statue of Argon on top of her. <laughs> and uh, imagine Michael Shannon as Argon. Oh God! You know, I can see it. 
<laughs> he, he would play the hell out of it. Oh, God almighty. Did you see the interview where they asked him, like, who do you think's going to win, Batman or Superman? He's just like, I don't fucking care. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, there was an interview for, um, it was for Batman vs. Superman, and it was um, Zack Snyder got the final question, and it was from a fan who was like, well, since you did it, who do you think would win, Batman or Superman? And Zack Snyder's like, you know, I made a whole movie about this. Why the hell would I answer the question here? It's like they're literally about to watch like a three hour fucking thing about that question. So, and it was like approximately about that question, like very tangentially about that. Question. Batman wins anyways. So. Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't he? He's got the fan, fan support. He's got, he's got, he's got the weakness of Martha. Yep. He's got all the prep time in every situation because the writers give him all the prep time. Never give Superman prep time. Who can like give him polio or something. <laughs> so whatever the fuck Holy up. Holy up. okay we're off topic yeah sorry but, so, going, going. but so um yeah o'brien carries off argon headed for the lab while poppy knocks susan down and runs for the helicopter and argon comes to before they get to the core and starts choking out o'brien by wrapping his arms around his neck like anacondas yep yep not the song the snake o'brien tries <laughs> to shake him off but they just bounce off the polymerized walls so more fun stuff Yep, yep. And so on the roof, Poppy has started up the helicopter, and Susan attempts to climb on when the building shakes again, sending both the helicopter and Susan towards the edge. And the helicopter stalls out when its landing gear catches on the guardrail, and they both hang precariously over the roof of the main lab that they will just bounce off of if they fall. (laughs) Pretty much. And O'Brien spots one of the liquid nitrogen sprayers and uses it to get three of Argon, spraying him down and then carrying him off again. <laughs> <laughs> then he makes it to Susan's lab in the massive crater where the core is melting down. And Argon, freeing his jaw, manages to talk, o- tries to talk O'Brien out of this and frees just part of one finger holding onto a pipe after O'Brien throws him in. And then O'Brien just forms a pair of scissors and snips the fingers loose, dropping Argon into the white fluid. Oh my god. <laughs> That was so funny. Yeah, it's great. That's up there with season two of The Punisher, where Jigsaw is like trying to make this big impassioned speech, and Frank just ignores him and shoots him. <laughs> oh, I love that because I was so sad because like it would already been canceled at that point, and I was like, oh, they're gonna set it up for a final Jigsaw season, like with Wilson Fisk, and he walks oh. in and he just shoots him in the head. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Thank God, because a whole season, a whole other season of that Jigsaw would not have been good. No, yeah, absolutely. He had his art. He had his time. <laughs> he had he had like a million friggin' therapy sessions. Yeah, I like the therapy sessions. God damn it. Okay, so the pool swells into a bubble, and O'Brien runs for it as Susan tries to save Poppy from the helicopter. And Nebelman wakes up in the garden. The bubble bursts, the force of the explosion making O'Brien super bounce down the hall and crash out the window. Yep. And the lab turns into the brittle ionic solid, and the tower tips forcing Susan to cling to the rails the helicopter, madly rambling Poppy inside, slips and crashes into the roof of the lab, shattering it into pieces and exposing the core. So she's dead. Yep. She's like, plastic is forever. Ooh. Plastic needs forever. If I could do the Harley Quinn voice, I would do it. Yep, same. But I'm simply not able to. You know, my balls are too far he, down. And also, you're not from New York. That's true. I don't have that accent. I'm not good at it. You're not from Brooklyn. You're from Massachusetts, and I'm from friggin' Maryland originally. So. Uh, yeah, I- I'm a lot closer to Boston than most, but I still couldn't probably pull that off either. You can't pack the car. Can't pack the guy in the get graph. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And so Nebelman appears on the roof and tries to kill Susan by peeling her fingers off the rail one by one. He got up there fucking quick, but the tower finally falls, throwing Nebelman into the core to his death. So by Yep, villain yep. uh guy <laughs> just some dude <laughs> and so susan falls as well but o'brien saves her by transforming into a lose shoot that's that's like the fucking hot wheels ramp Ex- oh the same thing except it's appropriate in like a goofy comedy like this also now that i'm thinking about it nebelman helpful assistant i feel bad he's dead <laughs> it was pretty great and so they kiss and then it cuts ahead to another day as it says <laughs> And as they're walking down the street, having just bought groceries, and they're reminiscing about that flashback from earlier. 
Yep. It's like, oh, we're very differing people now. And O'Brien sees the litter bug from earlier, who again tosses a styrofoam cup into the bushes. And he's like staring at him like creepily, like, like giving him the death glare. But Susan seems to talk him down. But we then see that he used his stretchy arm to not just throw away the cup, but stuff it in the litter bug's mouth and jam him in the wire mesh garbage can upside down. And that's where it ends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, but it also means he hasn't, like, changed as a person. <laughs> but whatever. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. This has been Wachowski's plastic script, man. Script. Man. And I liked it. It I- might be one of the best things they've done. I, well, yes, by default, it's not a bag of shit, but I will say, no, this story does kind of slap. I mean, this is so much better than the Green Arrow script we did. I mean, that being said, after a certain point, the entire thing becomes a full-blown comedy, but it's not even, like, trying to be, like, serious, but, like, I I don't know, like, for this tone and style of what Plastic Man as a character has always been, like, I I don't know, it's a pretty faithful version. You got a lot of the, the body trick things with, like, the hands becoming things and like that, like, I don't know, there's a lot of... I yeah. feel like there are absolutely definitely worse scripts you could have written, and the fact that this one's actually pretty decent is, like, shocking. That's yeah, it's actually, at. it's a good read. It just, I mean, granted, it does, it's not entirely faithful to his character. Like, he's different background, different things going on, different name, personality's pretty different. He doesn't have a, a sidekick named Woozy Winks. Yep. Yeah. But it is really good. It's a good intro. Like, I mean, it, it's the 90s, so it's not going to be a faithful adaptation. No, not at all. But the fact that it is this faithful in the 90s is kind of shocking. I mean, I've done this show three times with you. I've done this, I've done Green Arrow, and I've done the bad Van Helsing. I would rank them that way. I would say Plastic Man's the best, Green Arrow's second best, and Van Helsing is terrible. Um, this is like the first genuinely solid movie that I think I've done for this show. So thanks. Solid like a plastic. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks. Solic, unlike a plastic object, which is like the most wiggly, wiggly, <laughs> silly, kind of slithery, whatever. Especially like how shitty water bottles are now, where they fucking crinkle every time you touch it. Oh, do you mean? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I have like one near me. Like this. Do that. Yeah, I got, I got this. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, I know it's, it's like poison to do that near a microphone, but like I, I had it in my hand at the time. Like I, I had to, couldn't resist. Yeah, no, Plastic Man Wachowski's. I I was not disappointed. I was a little confused sometimes, but honest to God, it's it's not really a bad script. I'm kind of I kind of wish we I mean, saw it. Yeah, I do too. It could have used a little t- a few touch ups. Oh sure, sure. You know, so like some slim down, slim down some of the exposition. Like, yep. And the first maybe... the first thirty pages could be a little bit tightened up. With the rat that doesn't come back, that's a big deal to me. Yeah, you know? the mouse should have come back. Like they, it, it should have been like the ending scene should have been him catching the mouse. Either the mouse comes back, or you just don't have that as the opening because it seems more important than it is. Yeah, and don't have them talk about the mouse every other scene like they do for the first half. Exactly. Maybe like at the very end of the movie, you could even tack it on and like the mouse shows up or something. I don't know. Now, Whatever. yeah, but no, this was a really fun read. I would have liked to have seen something. Yeah, from this, I agree. Like, you could do this now. You could do the script now. You totally could. Like, I, I felt the same way when I read this, and I said the same shit for Green Arrow. Like, just put in the DCU as is. Just change two things. But yeah, you you could put it in. Like, I mean, if Shazam can be in the DCEU, so can this. This can super duper be like in the tone and style of Shazam and just work, and it'll be really fun to watch. Um, yeah, yeah, no, the script fact, is uh, surprisingly good. But, um, yeah, and so, yeah. So apparently, supposedly, what happened to this is that they couldn't agree on a budget. That makes sense. I said this earlier, but like that, it's incredibly difficult in 1995 to pull off the effects they're talking about because the mask this, has like 10 percent as crazy body effects as this script does. And also, there, it's a green, goopy-looking mask. You're not having to make like a realistic face. There's no flesh color to anything. Yeah. There's no like. In fact, they didn't recreate a human... They didn't, like, actually try to create a human face in CGI until, what? I think it was The Mummy Returns. Right, right. You know, no wonder the mask effects look so good, because whenever he's the mask, he has a mask on, so you can't see the actual human face, so it doesn't look weird when CGI. It just looks normal. But yeah, apparently this got... This got shuttered because of budget problems, which... I I mean, just, just look at the movie this that brian spicer directed in 1995 look at the effects in mighty morphin yeah 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 god <laughs> almighty mighty morphin dude the third act with like 
these weird like glossy polygons that looked like ass like oh god yeah oof oof indeed um, it, it, yeah it would not have worked out like they would have had to spend like an astronomical amount of money to get it even looking decent right and i like, see where they're coming from where it's like we can't guarantee we're gonna make like five or six hundred million at the box office in the 90s yeah no i see why it kind of fell through although it's a very creative idea yeah, and it it's good. It, it it popped the script to like like every review I've seen of this online has been very positive. Like even the one which had like a few negatives was like this script is really good. It just has a lot of differences from the comic book Plastic Man. Ah, a difference from a comic is not an inherent negative. Uh, people online, you know, they go nuts. They're not looking for a good movie. They want an accurate movie. Superman, Superman's costume is not the appropriate shade of blue. <laughs> it doesn't. It's not so bright. It makes your eyes burn out. Hypothetically, that means that they'd like uh, no um, no adaptations of anything ever because it's different at all. But whatever. Why doesn't Batman have gray on his suit? Well, okay. I've been saying that for a long time. I like all the all black, but everybody's been all black. The only one that's not all black is Affleck, which is why it's my favorite costume from from the and, Batman. Yeah. Movie. Oh, I love I love Affleck's costume. The, it's the, so good. The, the, the BVS one more than the weird. Oh um, yeah. Night, Night owl goggles one from from Justice League. I agree completely. The BVS suit and that oh that character introduction, fantastic. But hey, that's not the right the, there. I mean, the Batman parts of that movie are the best parts of that movie. So. Oh, easily. Absolutely. Like Superman's whole half of that movie is talking head on TV, talk shit about him, and he looks sad about it. Absolutely. Pretty much. But we're, get, we're, we're getting off track. We are. So Plastic Man, like aside from like internet reviews of this script in like the early 2000s, I didn't see, I wasn't able to find anything about this until later, because of course the Wachowskis went on to Matrix and they had a blank check from Warner Brothers for like a decade and a half after that. Yeah, including like up to and including Jupiter Ascending, which was in a, a fully original idea that got like blockbuster money. Yeah, and uh, this started getting talked about again in about it's like June 2008. So oh, after really? Speed Racer bomb, and there's a whole punchline to this. So don't worry. There was this whole chatter going on around that apparently they were going to revisit this and they were going to work with Keanu Reeves as Plastic Man. Oh, my God. And that it was, and that, oh, it's totally the next thing they're going to do. Well, it turned out that this was all bullshit because it was some guy saying that, oh, I heard Joel Silver say on German radio that they were doing this. And you read, like, the transcript, the supposed transcript. It's like, oh, this is so bullshit. Like, oh, the Wachowskis are saying they will only work with Keanu Reeves ever again. Yeah, okay. Well so it was a completely unsourced thing. Yeah, because the problem with Speed Racer was that Keanu Reeves wasn't in it. That's definitely the issue with that movie. Yeah, no, which I mean, and this is more. This script is more Speed Racer Wachowskis than it is Matrix. Oh, absolutely, a hundred thousand percent. But good. <laughs> but but good. It's also like S sorry, so Speed funny. Racer fans. It, it's so funny and like like whippy and stuff like that. I feel like you could just Keanu Reeves. I haven't seen him lead a comedy. You know, I don't know if he'd be like appropriate for that. You, know? you have. Oh, you haven't seen any Bill and Ted's. Oh, I forgot about the Bill and Ted's. But like, I still don't see like the that version of of Keanu appropriate for Plastic Man. You know, not this Plastic Man. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> but yeah, so that turned out to be bullshit. But it's one of those things where I do kind of have to wonder if there was maybe like a conversation about it behind the scenes. Mm hmm. Because. Okay, look at it. May 2008, Speed Racer bombed, and Iron Man just completely overshadowed everything else that month. Yeah, that's very true. So it wouldn't surprise me if, like, Joel Silver or the Warner Brothers people were talking to the Wachowskis going, hey, maybe revive this, and then any talk of that just ceased as soon as Dark Knight came out and Warner Brothers was like, ooh, shiny, and got distracted. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons that the Shazam in the early 2000s fell through is that Speed Racer failed and Dark Knight was successful. So. Yes, exactly. And I have that script. You have that Shazam? I have the early, I have the 2003 Shazam, which is supposed to be terrible. And I have the two drafts of the 2008 one, which one is pre, one is before they gave the order to go more Dark Knight with it. And one is after. How, are they similar to the script, the movie we got? I mean, tone-wise, yeah. Okay. Because but the, vil the villain is Black Adam. 
Oh, okay, that makes sense. Well, I mean, if who you watch would him, have been who would have been Dwayne Johnson even back then? Right, right. That's when they first cast him, which is hilarious. It's been like fifteen fucking years, and Black Adam just got delayed today. Like that's he's just not, hilarious to me. And he's still not going to be in a, in a Shazam or Captain Marvel movie. The yep. fuck. I know it just gets better, but um, no, I was I was actually about to say that like if you watch that first Shazam, the twenty nineteen Shazam movie with Zachary Levi, if you watch that movie, the villain is supposed to be black adam like if you watch it and like beat for beat story for story the villain also getting the shazam powers after the wizard said no and betrayed him or something like that and there's like a falling out there that you know savannah was i feel like they just wrote him out because the rock had his own separate black adam movie idea in mind and they were going that route so. well it was because warner brothers went we have one of the biggest stars in the world you know, signed up, let's give him his own movie. That was their call. Right, so they wrote it out and then, you know, kept a lot of the third act and framework and stuff. Yeah, interesting stuff. See, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a conversation and then Dark Knight derailed it. Like, they derailed, like, it derailed Shazam and partially derailed, partial was part of the reason why Justice League got derailed. Yeah, yeah, that's a big deal. Yep. And so, and then, like, it went away. And then in 2013 or 2014... There was rumors that because this was this was around the time when like Man of Steel happened and we knew BVS was on the way, but there was all these rumors flying around about what was going to be happening, what wasn't, and the internet treated every single one of them like it was a serious possibility. Like there was a period where where Justin Bieber flashed like a random a picture of himself on Instagram with like a random script title page. That said, Batman versus Superman. And everyone went, "Oh no, Beaver's gonna be playing Robin." Movie ruined. I remember that. I remember yeah. that. That's so weird. First of all, in hindsight, why the fuck did he do that? He's not any way associated with that movie. It was for um, it was for a funnier die sketch, apparently. Oh, oh, I totally did. Wow, I never saw it. Yeah, neither did I. Yep. And then there were during this t- period, there's like this rumor, this rumor, that rumor. There were so many stupid rumors, it was hard to keep track of them all. There was one that said that, I think this would have come about after Justice League was announced, but there was one saying that, like, ooh, Plastic Man's going to be in Justice League. He's going to be played by David Tennant. And it's like, and looking back on it now, it's like, Kilgrave? Oh, my God, dude. (laughs) But, of course, that was bullshit. And the next thing, it was, like, 2018, they announced that, like, it was being made by the new line side of Warner Brothers, like Shazam is. Yeah. And, like, Bob Shea was producing and they hired like a writer I had never heard of to write it. And they went, we went on this search, we found the perfect person. And then like a year later, they're like, actually, we're going to make it a female led movie. It's like, what? Yeah, they didn't elaborate on that. I remember that reading that report. They didn't elaborate how or why if like it would be plastic band and a bunch of women or if it'd be like plastic woman, which either way (laughs) sounds like a weird idea to take this direction of the story. It's, It's like a harem anime with plastic man. Yeah, that sounds arguably more sexist than not doing that. So, <laughs> God almighty. Surpr- surprising lack of sexism in this script. Yeah, how dare they? <laughs> For the 90s. Yeah, well, it's almost like the I cast mean, uh, is like our, I don't know, women now, so, you know. Yeah, and like, I mean, even Batman Returns, like Catwoman is like, has this very stereotypical, like, mousy, battered woman origin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. A little, a little part of that in there, sure. She 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 could be like Patrick Bateman's secretary. God, sorry, I thought you said Patrick Wilson. I'm, I'm oh, editing. God. No, I'm editing <laughs> Passengers 2008, and ooh, dude, dude, that movie is terrible. Wow. Oh my god, dude. It, you, you is it worse than? It. Is it worse than 2016? No. Uh, okay, it's funnier, but unintentionally funnier. They're both <laughs> okay. bad movies, but and they both and they both had scripts on the blacklist. Oh, yeah, of course, because they're just, they're so quality that they needed to be made. Um, what is confusing and hilarious? One is confusing and terrible. <laughs> Neither are good movies. Um, yeah, no, so anyway, Wachowski's Plastic Man, or at, rather, the pla- the character Plastic Man in general, it sounds like he um, never seriously was considered for a movie. I feel like, yeah, Amblin Entertainment wrote this script with the Wachowskis or whatever, but like, I mean, you said it yourself, the budget would have been astronomical to realize this vision and not have it look goofy and terrible. So, I don't know. I feel like this movie was just doomed from the start. And then recently, okay, well, th- the female-centric thing is just like a, like a, that sounds like a terrible direction to take Plastic Man. Like a, it sounds like a PR move. 
Yeah, pretty much. And think about this, though. Plastic Man had not one script, but two scripts written before they even tried to make a Wonder Woman movie. Yeah. yeah. The earliest Wonder Woman script I have is from 2001. Was that the Joss Whedon one? No, Joss Whedon is 2006. Oh, okay. I haven't done that episode just because those scripts aren't very interesting. I really don't feel like taking the time to take notes on them. <laughs> and there's like four of them. Jeez. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd read like... Because I remember you did like... You do stuff like Creature of the Black Lagoon where you'd read like 10 scripts based on this character. It's like, I don't want to read a load of scripts that are probably all bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, with Wonder Woman, it's not that they're all bad. It's that they're just not interesting to read. It's just like, okay, this... Yep, yep. Like, the Whedon one gets a lot of shit, but I honestly think it's the best of the four. Oh, wow. Wow. Because I've only seen, like, snippets of the Whedon one where, like, they're vaguely sexist remarks and comments. But, um... And everyone is like, it's horribly sexist, oh! Yeah. Well, like, I also find it weird that a script for a movie in Hollywood is clarifying that a character is hot. Like... Oh, they do that all the time. I don't know why. Like, it, it, are you going to assume that they're not going to cast, like, a 10 out of 10? Like, that's just law of the land in Hollywood. That's what the, that's what fucking L.A. is made out of. It's all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. Yeah, no, Plastic Man. Uh, a very creative way to take this character, I'll say. Yeah, it was fun. Like, it was a fun read. Yeah. That, that was slightly marred by you going, hey, you want to do it on Tuesday on, like, Sunday evening? <laughs> yeah, very true. A 127-page uh, script, which is long by script standards. Well, I had... Okay, well, I, I had started reading none of it at that point. So I was going to, like, take a night and just do it. But, um, yeah, no, things came up, and then I delayed it to Thursday, and then I delayed it indefinitely due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I, uh, I finally was able to reschedule today, thank goodness, because um, um, I happened to have no obligations and my girlfriend's out of town. So, oh, that helps. No work life, no personal life. Hey, guess what? I've been putting this off for a while. It's time. So, hell yeah. Time to get plastic. Time to polymerize myself. Oh, uh, because <laughs> plastic is forever. Plastic is forever. It means forever, I think is what she says. Yeah, something like that. It's, like, it's still stupid either way. And then Argon goes, I am a new man. Apropos. Unplugged. As you can see, <laughs> apparently free. But whatever. Which they never explain. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm going on a Matrix standard. No, that's fine. It happened. I mean, we got in the Bound reference. <laughs> we did. We did. We did not Dark Guinea. Which I'll have to do that again if we ever do Carnivore, because there's a character in that who is totally just Joe Pants again. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Dude, I what? love I love characters that are vaguely Joe Pants in scripts. Like, you can just tell when reading them. Yeah, I love when you did the, the Daredevil Electra double down, how you guys didn't know Joe Pants was in Daredevil. <laughs> like the beginning of the video, it's like, Joe Pants in the opening credits. Absolutely. But yeah, I think that wraps up Plastic Man. Why, yes, it does. We are here. We've arrived at the end of this wonderful journey with a script that, like, I, I, full, in, I full went in with absolute expectations of shredding this apart and just laying into it and it did not allow me to do that it was too good so yeah it never went full architect no it didn't and i'm so happy about that so i'm so i'm curious as to what you'll make of carnivore when you read that <laughs> and you know i will you know i'll get that far because um, you know we'll get to there eventually we'll probably do something else in between but... yep you, you know my taste you know my interests in terms of the the, the stuff that i like to read so there's no more universal monster content. So uh, I'm uh, except for those oh, there's... stupid mummy scripts you always lure. Oh, over I have a few. I have a few universal monster things you could do. Any crossovers? Because I feel like they're all just one offs. No, ah, there's no crossover scripts. Those bastards. And there was a, um, a a Jekyll script, which turned out it was a universal project. Oh, geez. OK. Nothing to do with Dark Universe. I'm sure. I'm sure they never wrote. That. So that would have been the third time. Jekyll was a universal monster. Yeah, ever. <laughs> After Avid and Costello and Van Helsing. Yep, yep. They even, but okay, okay, yeah. we are definitely need to sign off at this point. That's true. All right, I've been Jake of Hot Quality Content fame, youtube.com slash hot quality content, and I am joined by my main host, of course, Kieran Midhead. 
your adequate main host. <laughs> my, <laughs> the primary main host of this show, I would say, unless you've had substitute hosts. No, not for me. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm in all of them. This show wouldn't exist without me. That's true. You are the mitochondria of the cell, as it were. Do you have any idea what I've sacrificed? <laughs> I love that okay. meme. We got it. Okay, we're, we're done. We're done. We're done. That's right. the perfect. That's the perfect place to end it. Awesome. All right. Bye, guys. So, bye.